equations together. All right, because certainly I can't reteach everything that we've learned, right, um, this semester. But just some reminders. So think of it as reminders. Um, we started the, the semester talking about biologic molecules. So carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, as well as nucleic acids. So each one of these has um, a polymer state and a monomer state. In other words, there are building blocks, and then there are those building blocks put together. So like for carbohydrates, the building blocks are sugars which are usually six carbon um, rings, six or five carbon rings. Those sugars get attached together um, to form starches. The one that we talked about was glycogen, is the human starch, the, the starch that our bodies make um, for storing glucose. So that's carbohydrates. Um, proteins, the building block is amino acids, and those amino acids are put together in long chains, and those long chains fold into shapes and those shapes are proteins, so proteins and amino acids. Um, lipids, uh, the fatty acid is the monomer. In other words, that's the building block part. And fatty acids can be put together, and one of the most common ones is triglycerides, where there are three fatty acids on a glycerol backbone. So you have, again, the, the monomer and then the polymer. Um, for nucleic acids, that's DNA and RNA. Um, the nucleotides, or the bases, as they're often called, um, can be put together in long strings again. And those long strings, then, are going to be your DNA and RNA. DNA stores information. RNA transports it. In other words, it takes information from the nucleus, brings that information out into the um, uh, cytoplasm so that a protein can be made from that DNA template. So a little uh, bit of biochemistry is how we started. Then we talked about, um, well, we talked about cells, but I'm not going to review that today because that you've gotten in lots of other places. So, you know, the, the nucleus, the mitochondria, endoplasmic reticulum, smooth and rough, uh, ribosomes, all of those things. All right. Then we talked about tissue types. Tissue, a tissue, is a group of similar cells that all perform the same function. So don't confuse tissue with organ. An organ is a set of tissues that accomplish some particular function for the body. All organs are made up of four tissue types. The whole body is made up of four tissue types, and those uh, different tissues work together um, to accomplish everything the body does. So there's epithelium. We spent a long time talking about that both in here and in lab. So um, we uh, describe epithelium by the shape of the cell and then by the arrangement. So a simple epithelium is just a flat sheet, right? A stratified epithelium is a stack, you know, so they're stratified or, or layered. Um, the pseudo-stratified looks like a stratified, but it's actually a simple. You know, we talked about, we saw, we see that in the respiratory tract, the pseudo-stratified. And then the shapes. Squamous is flat, like a paving stone. Cuboidal is cube-shaped. Um, columnar is taller than it is wide. And then transitional is kind of neither of these. Transitional looks a little, um, uh, well, <clears throat> it can look like squamous or columnar or anywhere in between. But thankfully, we don't see transitional cells very often. So you can kind of ignore that one. Um, the uh, rest of the tissue types, muscle, connective tissue, and nervous tissue. There's three types of muscle, right? Smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle. So far, we've really only learned about skeletal muscle, right? Smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, you're going to learn about in AMP2. Um, uh, connective tissue, there are lots of different kinds. Um, the most common uh, tissue in the body is connective tissue, you know, in terms of weight. So most of the mass of the body is made up of connective tissue. So there was dense and loose and then regular and irregular, right? Uh, the patterns of... Uh, stuff in the tissues. Connective tissue, its claim to fame is there's always more stuff there than cells. So in epithelium, it's all cells, right? In muscle, it's all cells. In nervous tissue, it's all cells. In connective tissue, most of it is not cells. It's stuff that cells have made. Um, so protein fibers, you know, things like keratin, adipose tissue, most of what's there is not the cells themselves. And then nervous tissue should be very familiar because we just talked about it in this last unit. 
Um, so nervous tissue responds very rapidly to a change in its environment um, and uh, can transmit information um, over distance very quickly. So nervous tissue we've learned about. All right. Then we talked in the class about skin, um, which is not on my review list, but um, there's the dermis and the epidermis. Um, the epidermis is the top part made up of squamous epithelial cells. The dermis is underlies it. Um, and it has a kind of rubbery, uh, 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 elastic texture to it. Um, there were different layers of epithelial cells in the epidermis, um, and those layers are important, so review those. You know, the stratum lucidum, stratum corneum, stratum granulosum, all that stuff. All right. Then we talked about bones. The three important cells from bone that you should remember, osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and osteocytes. All right, osteoblasts are bone makers. Osteoblasts make bone around themselves until they get trapped in the bone that they've made. Then they're an osteocyte. Osteoclasts do just the opposite. They eat, they eat bone, so they dissolve bone. And um, bone is always being made and always being dissolved. So in the living person, the bones are never as old as the person is because the osteoblasts and osteoclasts are always turning things over. So your bone density, or the amount of strength in your bones, is going to be determined by the balance between osteoblasts and osteoclasts. So like in osteoporosis, the osteoclasts are winning. They're dissolving bone faster than the osteoblasts are making it. So the bones are getting um, uh, less and less dense and weaker and weaker. Some of the medicines that you hear about for osteoporosis on the TV are osteoblast stimulators. Um, in other words, they stimulate the osteoblast to produce more bone and shift that osteoporotic balance over to uh, strong, heavy bones instead. All right. Two types of bone. Uh, there's compact bone. Remember this arrangement of kind of like drinking straws all in, in parallel? Each of those drinking straws is an osteon. So we have these bundles of osteons, and then around the whole thing, we have kind of a giant osteon that goes around the outside. That's the circumferential lamellae. So that's compact bone, very ordered appearance. Spongy bone has all these little trabeculi, or these little struts or <laughs> scaffolds, with a lot of empty space in between. So we see spongy bone um, where uh, forces come into the bone in multiple directions. Um, so in the, the large parts of the bone is typically where we have spongy bone. Compact bone is heavy and strong. Spongy bone is lighter and stronger, um, but it's um, not as resistant to crushing. So it doesn't transmit forces as well as the compact bone does. All right. <clears throat> Just a reminder about long bone anatomy. We have Three very sort of, sort of weird words. The epiphysis is the knobby part at the top and bottom. The diaphysis is the shaft in between. And then the metaphysis is the, uh, where the two connect. So where the epiphysis connects to the diaphysis, we have the metaphysis. It's at the metaphysis in children that bones grow longer. That's the growth plate is uh, found at the metaphysis. So those three weird words. Diaphysis, metaphysis, and epiphysis. All right. Um, <clears throat> bones form, uh, well, most bones anyway, form from a cartilage model. So the developing fetus builds a, a cartilage copy of a bone, and then it's transformed into bone. So we call that um, endochondral ossification. Endo is inside, chondral is cartilage, and ossification is making bone. So you might want to just review that this, I'm not going to go through all this, but review this, the different steps in that endochondrial ossification. And then at its end point, you, we end up with an epiphysis here and a diaphysis. And then at the metaphysis, we have this cartilage plate that continues to grow. And as the cartilage grows, it then is replaced by bone, and it makes the bone get longer and longer and longer. So, this is what we would call the epiphyseal cartilage or the growth plate. All right. Let's see. Um, okay. 
Um, I said some of the most important uh, vocabulary that you'll get in this class is how to describe motion. Um, and you'll see, if you, you know, any of you that are already working in, in clinical spaces, you may have already seen these words, but if you haven't, you will. So be sure you know those. So flexion and extension, you know, flexion is a reduction in the angle between two bones. Extension is an increase. Um, uh, there's lateral flexion, there's plantar and dorsiflexion that's for the foot. There's abduction and abduct or adduction and abduction. This is in the lateral plane usually. Um, so uh, moving away from the midline of the body is abduction, abduction. Coming back in is adduction. All right. Then there's the rotations. You know, obviously the head rotates, but so do the um, the humerus and femur also rotate. So, you know, you can make this motion and that's rotation of the humerus, and you can do the same thing with your leg, that's rotation of the femur. And then pronation and supination. Supination is hands up holding soup, right? Pronation is hands down. That's also a rotation, and that's the radius is rotating. Remember that cool video where you can see the radius so cool so rotate? Sure it's it's one of the coolest drive. videos. Uh, yeah. But that's uh, supination and pronation. All right. And then the uh, uh, these actions are important to know too, even though not all parts of the body can do them. So like eversion and inversion, we really talk about that with the ankle, although you can say that you could do that with the wrist too. You can invert and evert the wrist. The foot uh, motions, dorsi and plantar, opposition, you know, what makes us different than a lot of primates. Then all the motions of the jaw, so retraction, protraction, depression, elevation. Incidentally, these motions are also things the scapula can do. Remember I showed you that video of how the scapula can move all around? Well, describing those motions, we often use these words too. So retraction and protraction and so on. Yeah. All right. All right. And then uh, we talked a little, we talked somewhat about a few specific joints. We talked about the knee and the elbow in particular. The knee joint comes up clinically a lot. It's one of the reasons why we spent some time on it and we focused on it a bit, because knee injuries are very, very common, um, both the overuse variety and the traumatic variety. Um, why? It's not that the knee joint is flawed in, in, in any way, but it carries all the way to the body across a relatively straight part of the leg, so it's exposed. You know, when you get hit from the side, you've got forces from the side, but then you have all your own weight going through the knee too. So it's a sort of recipe for disaster. But just to review, we have our lateral and medial condyles. So those are the smooth parts at the end of the femur, right, that allow the knee to move. Um, and then at the top of the tibia, um, we have the medial and lateral menisci. Um, they're sort of lens-shaped cartilages, so here and here. And they sort of hold the femur in place on the tibia, the medial and lateral con uh, uh, menisci do. So they, the medial condyle fits into the medial meniscus and so on. We talked about the cruciate ligaments in the center, so the ACL and PCL. Um, basically hold the femur and tibia together um, is, as two crossing ligaments. That's how they get their name. And then on the sides of the knee joint, there are the collateral ligaments. So the fibular collateral and the tibial collateral. Now, the more common names for those are the, the medial collateral is the tibial, and the lateral collateral is the fibular. So we talked about all those things. And we looked, we looked at some videos of the knee moving, too. All right. Um, and then, let's see, the, the other joint that we took a little time looking at was the elbow, which I guess I don't have a picture of. Um, but important to remember at the elbow that it is three bones, it's three articulations. So the humerus connects with the ulna, the radius connects with the humerus, and the ulna connects with the radius. So the elbow joint is sort of complicated because it's three articulations. You've got three different bones, all that have a joint with one another. All right. Let's see the elbow. And then, of course, everybody's favorite topic in the whole course was, of course, the sarcomere, right? Super boring and, and hard to remember. So 
review it to because they're they're easy questions to get right as long as you've sort of uh, you know refreshed or reminded yourself about what the different things are. So the Z line um, is at the center here of the thin filaments, right? The um, uh, M line is the center of the thick filaments. And then we have these different bands. So in the I band, there's only thin filaments. And then in the A band, there is both thick and thin filaments. And in the H band, only thick filaments. All right? So why did we learn this in the first place? Because this arrangement allows the thin filaments and the thick filaments to interact. And it's that interaction that causes muscle to contract. Remember by that, that big, long process of um, you know, calcium is released and tropo, tropomyosin moves, or troponin moves tropomyosin away from the binding sites on actin, that, that whole business. All right. Like we see right here. So calcium is released. Um, calcium comes from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it's released in response to an action potential. So now we can go back and have taken something we just learned and apply it to something we learned before. So the action potential that we learned about in this last unit, that very same process, that's what sweeps across the muscle cell membrane. You know, so when the motor neuron um, releases acetylcholine, that acetylcholine um, creates an action potential on the muscle cell membrane now. So not the neuron, but the muscle. So that change in membrane potential sweeps all across the muscle cell, down the little T-tubules into the, you know, the, the heart or the middle of the muscle, and it's that action potential that triggers the release of calcium. So um, just like you see in the neuron, you know, action potential travels down the axon, right? Triggers calcium entry into the uh, synapse. That calcium entry triggers neurotransmitter release, right? So this is a spot where muscle and nerve share some things in common. Um, action potential triggers calcium uh, release. And then that calcium makes the next thing happen, which in this case is the calcium binds with the troponin that moves tropomyosin, which is this thread-like molecule here, so that the active sites, the yellow parts on actin are exposed. And now actin thin filaments here and myosin thick filaments can interact. So myosin reaches up, grabs hold, releases its ADP um, and P, that causes a, a ratcheting motion um, here, which pulls this um, thin filament this way. Um, and then that myosin head is reset, and this process goes and goes and goes again. So review that contraction cycle, the sliding filament mechanisms, the um, uh, uh, excitation contraction coupling. In other words, how does the nervous system trigger this release of calcium that causes this to happen. All right. Muscles have different organizational patterns, just a refresher. You know, so we have the uh, um, uh, convergent muscle, where uh, there's a broad base that all converge on one point. We see these in the extremities. So the pectoralis, uh, in some ways, the, the gluteus maximus is a little bit like this too. So convergent muscles can have a wide range of motions. Um, then we have the pennate muscles. So uh, the uh, bipennate is where there's two like this. So pennate just means feather-like. And you can imagine this looks a little bit like a feather with the arrangement. Um, so bipennate muscles look like that. Unipennate muscles look like half a feather. So a feather that's had the bristles on one side cut off. Um, and then the sphincter. So a circular muscle is a sphincter. All right. Let's see. Oh, rotator cuff. Just to remind you, because of course there's going to be at least one question on the rotator cuff on there, right? So the rotator cuff muscles, supraspinatus, <laughs> infraspinatus, subscapularis, and teres minor. So most of these muscles get their name in relation to the scapula. So the supraspinatus is above the spine of the scapula, which is right here. The infraspinatus is below that spine. The subscapularis is on the back of the scapula. Well, it's, okay, it's on the, the front of the scapula. So it's on the anterior portion of the scapula that, that you can't see from the outside because the ribs are in the way. So we've taken the ribs off here. 
And then the one that doesn't belong is Terry's minor, um, which sits here uh, just sort of underneath the inverse fanatus. So why is the rotator cuff important? Because it holds the arm in place. Um, the shoulder joint is really, really weak um, in terms of bony or uh, uh, ligament attachments. So what holds our arm on the rest of our body is really the rotator cuff. And that's its job, is to sort of tug on the arm all the time, holding it into its socket so that it can move and flex in all the different ways that it does. Because of that important um, uh, action, holding the arm in place, you wouldn't want your arm falling off, right? The, the rotator cuff gets a lot of stress. You know, it's used all the time. It's, um, it's torqued and stretched. You know, if you play tennis or golf or any of those things, your rotator cuff is absorbing a lot of energy all the time. So rotator cuff injuries are very, very common. All right. Okay, so that's all I had for the review. Um, or, or, and really, all I did was hit some of the things that I know are on the final <laughs> that uh, sometimes students miss. So, yes. Can they do a rotator cuff repair? Mm -hmm. uh, where do they repair it at? I mean, how do Normally what they do is, um, they the idea is they want to tighten this up. So they'll take these ligaments off and they'll move them up more lateral on the humerus so that everything is tighter. But a lot of times people have rotator cuff surgery, they have to have it again because the muscles loosen up again. The same thing recurs. Yeah? From this last section, is there going to be a whole bunch of stuff like on this last It's about equally distributed. You know, so like there should be the same number of questions from the unit one, two, and three. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so here's going back. Uh, oh, please, if you haven't already logged in, hopefully you've logged in already. Let's see. We got just a ton of people out today, too. All right, I'm ending the little quiz thing. All right, so transitional epithelium, which we just talked briefly about. Anybody remember where it's found? So, very good. Lining the urinary bladder. Good. Lots of you got that. Um, so, yes. Uh, lining the stomach, um, you're going to have columnar epithelium, surface of the skin, squamous epithelium, um, kidney tubules. Maybe some of you remember that from lab. That's the cuboidal cells. There are not pictures. The cell, no, I can still ask you questions about it, though. But, like, for some of the um, quicker questions, it was, like, identify the tissue. And it's, like, no oh, tissue. no, no, no. That, that we did in lab. Okay. Identify this tissue type is what you're talking about. Yeah, no, there won't be any questions like that. Okay. No. All right, cells that store fat. Did you all lose one already? Hmm? I didn't send it. All right, there we go. <laughs> Boom, everybody got that one. So that's adipocytes, D. Um, and remember, when you look at that tissue, it's, it's sort of skeleton-like. You see just the little uh, remnants. All right, why won't this advance? There we go. Well, here's a good analogy question. Chondrocytes are to cartilage as osteocytes are to... 
Everybody loves questions like this, right? No, not at all. Yeah. Yeah. Would you make more questions like that on the test? <laughs> People hate questions like this. I think the uh, the ACT and the SAT burn people out on these analogy questions. I like analogies, but I don't like it when I don't know what they're talking about. Because they'll give you words that you don't know, like old, tiny terms. I'm like, I don't know what that is. This is 2008. Come on. That's been one of the big complaints of the standardized testing. Is they that haven't updated it. Well, and that it's so much more, it's more a vocabulary test than an intelligence and test. And we don't learn vocabulary in school. Right. I didn't. The only thing that I Boom, learned everybody got that one too. Good, that's fine. School was Azure, which means All right. All right, the blank in keratinocytes protect the epidermis and dermis from the harmful effects of sunlight. This is reaching back. It was snowy and cold outside. Oh, wait, that was last week. <laughs> this is in the box. As long as it doesn't snow in June. Because I don't have All right, jump in there. So final, are you going to pull up from the exams and homework more than the clicker questions? It ends up being more exams and homework and clicker questions, yes. Because I printed everything wrong, but... Aren't those all the questions? Yes. What? Exams, homework, <laughs> clicker questions? So which ones? Are, is it going to be more of the exam questions? It's more exams and homework and clicker questions. Because clicker questions are usually harder. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes. Is it just one hour that we have then? For the final? You can have as much time as you need. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, no problem. All right, so we have a split between B and D. So you do remember some things about keratinocytes, right? You know that there's keratin in them, or they wouldn't be called keratinocytes, right? Melanin is the correct answer here. So melanin is a brown pigment made by melanocytes. And then it's kind of injected into the epidermal cells to give them some UV protection. So what is keratin then? Shh, quiet down. Keratin is a protein um, that's very tough and water resistant. And the cells of the epidermis, as they move from the inner layer to the outer layer, they, they get more and more of this keratin inside. So like when you touch the surface of your skin, what you're touching is really keratin. So, you know, what is keratin? Well, it's this stuff right here that gives us kind of this flexible shell that we have. All right. The region of the long bone between the end and the shaft is the which of those? I think this should just be the final because this is great. <laughs> well, I let the computer pick the final questions. I mean, I, I review its work, but... They're taken semi randomly. Crap, the drama. Huh? It's a drama. I think all of us who are here should get like 20 extra. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Everybody takes the same test. Yeah. Some people on campus have experimented with a test bank like that where not everybody takes the same test, but yeah. All right, we have a split between A, B, and C. So metaphysis, <laughs> diaphysis, and epiphysis. I know these words are kind of strange, but the region between the end and the shaft, that's the metaphysis, okay? Because the end is the epiphysis, the shaft is the diaphysis, so the middle part is the metaphysis. Fun words to say, good Scrabble words too. <laughs> All right. The type of bone that is adapted to withstand stresses that arrive from many directions. I once had an 
English teacher. Yeah. <laughs> she, she, we couldn't get past her saying thesis sentence. Like she would just say thesis sentence, and we just, just couldn't <laughs> keep it together. Oh, it was awful. Thesis <laughs> All right, jump in there. You don't have to wait. Well, you all are narrowing things down expertly today, <laughs> but not always nailing it. Okay, most of you did get this one right. That's spongy bone. So, the reason why we have these two different kinds of bones is because forces travel through the body in, in different paths. You know, like the, the, the pelvis sits on top of the femurs, right? And the femurs carry the weight down to the tibia. Well, anytime that forces have to go around to bend, that's where you're going to have spongy bone, because it can do that. It can take a force and, and, and send it this way. Compact bone is just a straight line. You know, so the centers of bones, you know, like the femur, has a shaft that's just carrying weight from the top to the bottom. That's where we find the compact bone in. All right. Uh, yeah, we'll do this one. The largest and strongest articulation at the elbow is which of those? Don't let it seem complicated. You know, you, you know this stuff, so work it out, even if you don't know the instant answer. Go through each of the answers and think about what the words mean, like we've been talking about, and you'll, you'll arrive at the right one, I think. My belly was stuck. All right, so three articulations at the elbow, right? Three bones. So you've got the humerus, the ulna, and the radius, right? Those are the players. So if you remember that the ulna has that big U shape at the end, right? That U shape fits in to the, uh, the end of the humerus. So it's, it's almost a bone-on-bone -bone connection. So the humeral ulnar joint is the strongest of the three, okay? The um, humeral radial joint is one that you don't actually hear very much about, but that's where the radius attaches just barely to the humerus, so it's pretty weak. The ulno-radial joint is where that supination motion happens. Um, and that's where the radius turns, spins in that um, um, annular ligament. Oh, we'll skip that for sure, okay. Yeah, we'll do this one. Muscle fibers differ from typical cells. Why? Yeah, the last three weeks is just the paper is due on Wednesday, and the take home still with Friday. No, two separate All right, jump in there, last few people. We have an interesting uh, outcome on this question. All right, we have a split between the question got you and you got the question. All right, so muscle fibers differ from typical cells in that muscle fibers, okay. Do muscle fibers lack a plasma membrane? No. No. Are they very small? No. No, they're very big. Are they, do they lack mitochondria? No. No, because mitochondria muscles have to have lots of mitochondria, right? Tons of ACPs. Have many nuclei? 
Correct. Yes, so the correct answer there is D. Now, half of you put E. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because you didn't read the question, <laughs> or you didn't read all the answers. So don't get fooled by all of the aboves. You know, all of the aboves are not always correct. They are often correct, but they are not always correct. All right. Yeah, here's a good one. Which of the following best describes the sarcoplasmic reticulum? A word or a phrase which you probably didn't know before you started this class, right? Not a good Scrabble word, sarcoplasmic. Mm -hmm. Need too many letters. <clears throat> <laughs> well, I told you all the first class session that this isn't much of a vocabulary class as it is anything else. It's like a language class. Exactly. I always like freak out a little when you're like, all right, the password for this is like that one. Like, How do I spell that? <laughs> all right, which of these sarcoplasmic reticulum? That would have be D, storage and release site for calcium ions. So the skeletal muscle cell, it holds calcium ions inside itself. And in, re in response to an action potential, it releases those calcium ions inside the cell, and that triggers muscle contraction. In the other kinds of muscle cell, cardiac and smooth, they don't, there is no sarcoplasmic reticulum, or it's not as well developed. So instead, the calcium comes in from the outside. All right, um, the thin filaments are anchored at the Z line. The repeating unit of striated myofibrils, that's the sarcomere. Um, my myosin molecules, those are the thick filaments. And then uh, the protein that accounts for elasticity, that's titan. T-I-T-I-N. All right. Um, we won't do that one. The powerful abductor muscle of the upper arm. Are you all raising your hands? Or you... I know. I always do that whenever I'm trying to think about it. When we were doing the muscle stuff, whenever I'd go to the gym, that's what I would do in my head. Yeah. I'd be <laughs> Smart. <laughs> the machines were actually oh, this is the of the humorous. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope you found it. I did. In my brain. Like the movie doing... lady? All right, I think that's everybody. All right, so the correct answer there, that's the deltoid. So it sits up here on the top of the shoulder. What's interesting is the deltoid can only go so far. That's, that's as far as the deltoid can go, is straight across. Because at that point, the humerus bumps into the, the clavicle and the acromion process. So after that, the scapula has to move. You know, so it, when you raise your hand, for example, the deltoid gets you up to here, but then it's the trapezius and the scapula movers that move the rest of the way up. Um, some of you put the pectoralis major, which is an adductor. So it's, it does the opposite motion, and it um, uh, allows for adduction across the midline. All right. Most of the skeletal muscles in the body are which of those muscle patterns? <laughs> you remember that. Did you want me to sit again? Are you cold? <laughs> yeah, I don't know that the heater or air conditioning has really figured out what's going on outside. Heat one day. Well, and I think the system is either one or the other. Like they can't, they, they have to turn it to heat or turn it to cool. It can't do both. All right. So most of you, uh, B is correct. Parallel muscles. So um, convergent muscles, remember, uh, have a broad start and a narrow finish. 
Parallel are the most common, so that's your biceps, your uh, rectus femoris, that kind of thing. Circular muscles are called sphincters. Pennate muscles have that feather-like pattern. Straight muscles isn't one we've talked about. That's not a phrase we use. Ah, here we go. Very good question. The ion that triggers the release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft is which of those? There's a lot of similarities between muscle and nerve. We we can't get into that stuff because we'd have to go back after we learned it. But yeah, well, that's what I was thinking as we were talking about. I was like, this looks exactly like the muscle stuff. <laughs> There's a lot of similarities. The end point is different, you know. Mm -hmm. In uh, the nerve releases a you know neurotransmitter, the muscle contracts, but a lot of the physiology in the middle is the same. Yeah. Because they, they both will, so you would be testing them. Yeah. yeah. Very good. I'm proud of you all. That's E, calcium. So C, you have learned a few things. Of course you have. But um, calcium is one of those things that. Uh, it doesn't exist in huge amounts in the body except in bones, but calcium is a major player in everything important that the body does. So muscle contraction, calcium is hugely important. Um, nerve uh, conduction or, or release of neurotransmitter, calcium is hugely important. Next semester you're going to see calcium plays a role in blood clotting, platelet uh, <laughs> aggregation. It plays a major role in the, in the heart. Um, so calcium is like a major player. All right. One of the ways uh, that um, lethal injection used to be done was calcium chloride because too much calcium will just shut everything down and stop the heart. All right. So blank, open or close in response to binding specific molecules. So which of those kinds of channels? Oh, what are we turn it on Wednesday? Um, all of the different positions under being questions for that day. So I think it's the dependent position on <coughs> civil liberties in or. All right, jump in there, last person. Got to commit. Not going to play. All right, so this is a good question because it really gets at do you understand what we've been talking about? So, you know, what is a chemically gated <laughs> channel? Well, it's a channel that opens or closes in response to specific molecules. So, we have talked about sodium channels and potassium channels. So, like, um, there is a acetylcholine sodium channel. In other words, when acetylcholine binds to that sodium channel, that sodium channel opens. And causes membrane depolarization. So these chemically gated channels are critical to making a cell do something in response to another cell's activity. The voltage gated channels are important for propagating information from one side of the cell to the other. So in the action potential, the action potential starts with chemically gated channels that bring the cell to threshold, but then it's the voltage gated channels that do the rest that do that depolarization and repolarization routine. All right. Mechanically gated channels we find in sensory cells. So, you know, if you poke yourself in the back of the hand, you're activating neurons using mechanically gated channels because as you deform those uh, cell membranes, sodium rushes in and causes a depolarization that sends to your brain that something is, is touching you. All right. Uh, we'll skip that one. Here's a, this one should be fresh, right? The auditory cortex is located in which part of the brain? Let's remember each of those first four had a kind of claim to fame or a, a special <laughs> purpose in the brain.
the insula is a, is, uh, it's a little strip of nervous tissue on the inside. You have to look at the brain from the inside. <laughs> All right, good. So temporal lobe. So auditory, temporal, parietal lobe, that's where the sensory cortex is, right, for the, the general senses so touch. The frontal lobe is where the motor cortex is, and the occipital lobe is where the visual cortex is. All right. We're going to skip that one. See, a lot of these are from this last unit. didn't choose very randomly. Here's a good one. The maintenance of a constant internal environment in an organism. So this goes all the way back to chapter one. And hopefully every biology course that you've ever taken has at least mentioned this word. All right, everybody's choosing the same one, so I know you've got it. Homeostasis, right? Two other uh, points on this. Negative feedback and positive feedback came from chapter one, worth looking at just briefly, right? Negative feedback is what we're used to, you know, like in terms of um, how a lot of things in our world work. So like your air conditioner, for example. Negative feedback turns a, uh, puts a thing back to normal. So it, it negates the change that took place. So like in your house, the temperature goes up, air conditioning comes on, temperature goes down, air conditioning goes off. It's a return to a baseline, a return to normal. So those are the common ones. Positive feedback is a change reinforcer. In other words, some change happens and the body makes more and more of that change occur. So like blood clotting, for example, is a classic positive feedback mechanism where a small change gets amplified into a large change. So the two kinds of feedback that um, are important to homeostasis. All right. Which plane divides the body into right and left? Jump in there, last person. All right, very good. You all got that. And let that stuck because these planes of the body are another thing that, like the motion words, you're going to hear in the rest of your life. Because, um, particularly with imaging techniques, you know, x rays, CT scans, MRIs, ultrasounds, what you usually get is a picture of the body in one of these planes, okay? So the sagittal plane is in left and right. The frontal plane is front and back. So it, you know, it cuts the front of the body from the back. And then the transverse section cuts across. So like virtually every CT scan you'll ever uh, see is going to be shown to you in a transverse section. You know, so it's, it cuts the body like this. Now, MRIs are cool because the, uh, you can show the information from any of the different planes. So you can show a sagittal section, a transverse section, or a frontal section. So I'm glad you all got that. All right. Here's a good one. The heart is what to the lungs? And then we'll call it a day after this one. Oh, I have to send it to you, though. Okay, some uncertainty on this question. Jump in there, last couple people. I guess it is time to go.
Uh, so the best hand today would be medial. So um, all of those words, posterior, lateral, distal, proximal, medial, review those because, again, those are words that you're going to use your whole life. All right, I'll see everybody on Monday.